Thanks for taking the time to check in with today's X Essentials class, which is going to be on converting X lights, uh, Lightorama into uh, X light sequences. Uh, and this is based on the 2018 version. Uh, I want to remind everybody to please go to www.xlights.org, scroll down on your screen, and make sure you click the donate button to support the developers, the creators, the people who work to make this software some of the most awesome software that you could possibly ask for uh, for your holiday displays. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you guys for letting me um, take hopefully around an hour of your time, maybe a little less, uh, to go through a couple things with uh, X lights and Light Aroma. Um, so we'll get started with, uh, where did I begin? Um, in, 20, in 2004, I bought the house. And as you can see here, this was my original display. This was two separate outlets for, um, for my house. I hadn't wired anything. It's probably a terrible picture. Uh, it's, probably, it's the best picture I could find of my old display. And it was 100% static. It started with lights around the windows and then I gave up and I put wreaths in the windows as you can see there. And I just, I went to Walmart and uh, that's where I got a lot of stuff and uh, a lot of other places as well. Um, but in 2007, something amazing happened and uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna show the video, but, um, and it doesn't wanna show up now. There it is. Uh, I saw this video on YouTube. This is Carson. Wilson's house in, uh, I think it's Circleville, Ohio. And I watched this probably a thousand times from mid-December 2015 uh, through the, the whole month of January 2000, uh, I'm sorry, 2007 through 2008, January 2008. Whenever I saw this, I thought, wow, that's amazing. Wow, this is so cool. This is the greatest thing I've ever seen. I bet you I could do that. If that guy could do it, I'm smart enough too, I can do this. And this is what really got me into the hobby uh, of, of Christmas lighting. Um, now I fast forward to uh, a year, that year later, 2008 through 2012, and it was 100% LOR. I started with on the left-hand side is one of the videos you can look up uh, on the Leechburg Lights YouTube channel. It's the 2008 uh, Christmas light show pilot year, um, if, you, if you do the search. And uh, it was so basic and so horribly sequenced, but I look back on it and I think, wow, that was the first year. And it took me two months to figure out how to work it all. Uh, fast forward from 2008 through 2012, I grew from 64 channels to two, uh, 250 four channels and on the right hand side and this was compliments of my neighbor she had a very nice camera and was took many nice pictures of the house for me and uh, I loved it I absolutely loved it and in 2012 uh, I came I, I, I was going out on the shopping binge the day after Christmas and I found these things called flex tech arches and these flex tech arches are what thrust me into a, a full-on RGB light display. On the left side of your screen, you're gonna see the 2013 Leechburg lights display, which was the first year I went full-blown uh, uh, animated uh, digital with uh, LEDs, 100%, 99% LEDs, I should say. And there were, all, there were about 32 channels of AC LOR controllers, and this was all done in LOR. Um, my mega tree, I had many setbacks. I learned a lot of lessons my first year in 2013. But one of the things I learned is that I had to document things so I didn't forget them. And that's where in 2014, you began to see videos uh, from my basement, videos from the shop, videos from my kitchen about how I built something because I didn't want to forget. Um, so I started with about 7,000 channels RGB total. And most of them, 90, 80% of them were dumb RGBs. I had literally three strings of pixels, four strings of pixels, plus three pixel props maybe, and that was it. Uh, but that was okay because I really didn't sequence much in uh, LOR because it was just so damn challenging. Now on the right here you see this is this last year's, this most current year of, uh, of AC, of, of, um, of, of pixel decorating, and this is, uh, nine total channels of LOR period. Uh, I have 
completely, uh, I've completely backed away from LOR because I found that I could use uh, what I needed to using dumb uh, RGBs. And I also found that pixels were a little bit easier to deal with once you had more pixel controllers and you had them located throughout the yard and so forth. So um, why I converted from LOR. And uh, the, the, basically, whenever I started in, in the summer of 2015, and this, this, this program that I'm putting on tonight, uh, uh, it took me on a pretty interesting history lesson that uh, I completely forgot about and something that I wanted to share. And that was in 2013, my major conversion was from AC into RGB, and I totally didn't plan it. I just wanted to be able to make my new flex tech zippy arches bounce with the music to LOR and I couldn't get it to do it the way I wanted it to. And then I began to learn that I had to learn, uh, I had to, I had to learn some new stuff. Um, so I, I jumped literally from 254 LOR channels to 7,000 channels in uh, DMX from LOR. And LOR did work. It did it very well, but it was just very slow. So uh, the other thing that if, if there are LOR people sitting here on the call, you may, you may know or you may have heard or you may remember that uh, at one point in time, uh, LOR users were, were preaching an old and cheap computer could run the S2 or S3 or even S1 software for that matter. You didn't need anything that was uh, beefy and powerful to uh to run a, a simple light show with some with you know 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 LOR controllers. Well, in 2013 and 2014, that was not the case. It was not easy to sequence pixels in the LOR sequence editor. It, it was, uh, it, 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 I won't say it wasn't easy. I, I guess a better way to say it would be is there wasn't pixel uh, sequencing available. It was solid on, off, fade up, fade down, and twinkle shimmer effect. And you could do a lot with that. You still can do a lot with that. But to take advantage of the ability that these uh, things called pixels had or dumb RGB just in general, you, LORS3 uh, really didn't have a whole lot to offer other than the fact that it just worked, it would do the job. And, um, and the, the other thing that, that we learned and that I began learning about was x 3. Um, it was developed, I believe, uh, I, I don't want to go into history lesson, I'm not going to speak for anybody, but it was developed sometime 2012, 2013, right whenever I was getting into the RGB side. Uh, L X-Lights 3 had the ability to export effects into LOR. And uh, what this led to was what I call the copy-paste crash nightmare. And if you if you did a lot of and I, when I say a lot of I say a thousand pixels for a mega tree or uh, two hundred pixels on two roof lines was almost too much for the buffer or the cop, uh, for the clipboard to, to deal with in uh, uh, LOR at some times. So I would sequence the pixels in X lights and I would export them into LOR and it would crash and I would have to go back and start over again. And that was so devastating, especially since I was so far behind the eight ball and trying to get my display running that when I finally did get it up, I didn't have any sequences ready for it. So uh, coupled with that, my 2013 year went off finally about Jan uh, December 5th. Um, and then I had another great failure, the, the great delete, I call it, of, of Dropbox in 2014 for whatever reason. I thought it was a great idea. I thought I had backed up my sequences and so this is a huge reminder to everybody back up your sequences put them on a thumb drive save them on a different computer put them on dropbox in six different folders whatever do whatever you have to do don't ever let yourself lose all of your data like i went in and i pushed the delete key because my dropbox was getting full and that was basically where i began to melt down probably 2014 probably September, October, after I had begun putting up the lights. I was like, oh God, I've lost all my sequences. Uh, another thing that I wanted to uh, uh, bring up was Sean's vision of the 2014 X-Lights uh, 4.0. He, he made a video, and if you go to his Vimeo account, it's still on there, and it was, it was very memorable uh, how he talked about using Audacity as like a backdrop for what he'd like to see in the next incarnation of X-Lights 4. 
Well, when I lost all my sequences, I had half of the sequencing done already in x 3.0 from the prior year. The challenge was is I couldn't get x 3 to work with my, with my LOR setup. And uh, so I banged my head until about December 5th or 4th again in 2014. Now, I, later on, I finally, I, I eventually got the display to run 2014 with, went off afterwards without a hitch, but I was, I was literally frustrated and I, I was just beat up from LOR. And then Sean came out with the opportunity to alpha test some of the new programs he wanted to call x 4.0. And this was during the month of December of 2014. So why am I telling you all of this? Why, why do you all need to know this? And I, I think it's important that, um, that you all have an understanding of you have your own story. Everybody has their own story why they made a decision to move from one software to another. Um, I absolutely love the LOR software. It works. It is solid. It can do the job. It just doesn't do it the same way that other software does it. And if you understand that, then you, you can begin to realize that it doesn't matter what software you use. It's understanding how you use the software to get what you want done. Um, I found it much simpler for me to work in x lights and which is why I devoted much of my time to teaching people how to use this software because I felt it was important to have an additional uh, uh, way to program or work with your display and, as well as uh, create a, help work with a community of people who were willing to help others as well. So um, if I go back to 2012 versus 2013, my major conversion from AC uh, was to 95% RGB. Uh, I had nothing at all CCR wise. I had no CCBs. I did only DIY stuff. Everything was hand built. I didn't buy anything pre-made. I did have two controllers built for me. Uh, they were two E682s. I still have those today. Maybe Keith has one of them now, but, uh, but that is that is where I came from, and whenever I came into it, there there wasn't a whole lot of oh I have this pixel controller it's built, and here's these pixels and they have plugs and you plug them in and it just works and everything's it's a one shot it's a one stop shop that didn't exist back then so we had to create our own uh, way to get things built, and uh, and the same thing happened in X lights and LOR we had to learn how the software worked. So the, the, uh, the goals for this existential class are um, very simple. I have three methods that I'm gonna talk about today. First, uh, uh, for importing from LOR, and those are the data layer, the mapping, and the superstar sequence imports. So these are the three ways that, we, that I know that we can bring data in from LOR into x -Lights. Now. Uh, I, I will say there is a lot of information out there on the internet. He did a fantastic video last spring, I want to say, uh, and it is in the videos.xlights.org website that you can go and view it afterwards uh, or whenever uh, that really goes into great detail about mapping. If you're interested in data layers, I highly recommend anything that Andy Harrison has taken the time to talk about. Um, Sean Meehan has gone through in great detail how to do data layers and you can find his his and his Vimeo uh, videos on his uh, account and also John Storms has gone through the process of using data layers the data layers is uh, uh, and I'll get into this the data layers I've made one video on it and it's more of all about which is what I'm going to go through today uh, in this next section so when we talk about a data layer import, we're actually talking about pulling in data from an LOR sequence. Uh, so why would we use a data layer? Well, in my case, and there's a lot of subjective things here that work for different people, I had lots of AC channels. What I thought was a lot was 250. Uh, some people will say, well, 64 is a, a lot of channels, or even 32 can be a lot of channels. But if you have a massive uh, AC channel count that has been programmed into LOR, uh, it, it's very easy to bring it in via a data layer. And uh, it, it's very simple, it's nice. It's very nice to have that come in because then it's, it's ready to go. 
Uh, so the next thing is, is do you have pixels or RGB effects in the sequence editor? So if you open up your LOR uh, sequencing in the sequence editor, did you use the color wash tool a lot? Did you chase uh, colors between, uh, did you import effects from x 3.0 uh, into, uh, like I, I used it for 2013 sequences and then I didn't save it. So uh, all of them I didn't have, some of them I did but uh, I, I didn't have that ability to recreate it. So it was already in my LOR.LMS file. Uh, and also, do you have the pixel editor sequencing, the intens intensity files? Unfortunately, at this point, uh, unless something has changed within the past two or three months, I don't believe that the intensity files from the pixel editor can be imported into x -Lights. And uh, anybody's welcome to correct me if I'm wrong because uh, I did do some due diligence but I, and I didn't find anything, but that may change at any time, of course. So um, the other reason why you might want to use a data layer is your sequencing is done. It doesn't need changed ever again. You're not going to manipulate it or change it or upgrade it or anything. The data layer works great for these reasons. So how does the data layer work? Well, first of all, what x does is x pulls the data from the LMS file and creates a new x file called an ISEQ. Now, th this ISEQ actually becomes the foundation for your sequence. And as you can see in the right-hand side of the page here, uh, you can see I have a book that's the Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and it actually has a piece of tracing paper over top of it. So when you think of a data layer, think of, the layer of data that's already been created as that book underneath. And then, then imagine x -Lite's sequencer screen or the sequence tab as a, uh, as a piece of tracing paper where you can write whatever you want over top of it and erase it and whatever you can do. You can, you can scribble all over the tracing paper, but you'll never change that book. And the only way that you can change that book is if you go back into the original LMS file and make changes. So it becomes the foundation of your sequence. It's non-editable. It can't be modified or changed in the x -Lite sequencer. Uh, once this is attached, the ISEQ file is always there and it's always underneath the x -Lite sequence tab. Um, and we'll show, I, I can show an example uh, in a little bit to, to uh, help exemplify the point. The other thing I will mention is that uh, as far as the as far as uh, sequencing goes, as far as the uh, the the data layer goes, you can always uh, convert from the data layer an effect. Now, in some cases, it does work just fine. There have been some remote cases that it doesn't work. Uh, so just be be aware that that is an option that's available to you. That you can bring something in as a data layer. You can right click over the uh, properties or the the prop that is or the model and you can change the effect. And I can show that to you later. So this was my method of using the data layer in uh, one of my sequences. And uh, this consequently can be found in one of my videos as well, where I talk about the data layer, the all about data layers. And uh, my use of it here is I was converting in 2014 to the 2015 layout. And um, like, like everything else in life, I put things off and I, I started probably about uh, August and I, it's kind of funny, like I said, I was doing the research for this earlier and I learned that in August I was trying to get my data layer to work. There were a number of other folks, Andy Harrison was fantastic to, to help walk me through it and there was a lot of things that I learned, but the data that I was trying to pull in was uh, actual AC channels. Now, what you're looking at here are the arches. If you if you see the the uh, uh, L, the X lights uh, channel reference, it says strand number one and node one, two, three, four, and so forth. These were my eight of my uh, arches that were the flex tech, and I used those for the past five years. The sequencing, and I'm still using sequences now that use my ISEQ files or the data layers. Uh, that these are the the original sequencing that I created in X lights that I imported into LOR but I didn't take the time to go back and resequence. And it was very nice to be able to do this because I didn't have to resequence something. Now I'm going to point out, if you look on the right image, you'll see, uh, you'll see what looks like a wave, uh, a, a V form or a chase. Uh, you'll see that node one, I have already converted 
the effect from the data layer into an actual effect. So it is possible to do that whenever you're, you have sequencing that you'd like to copy from a data layer file that you can paste it into other, uh, into other models. So uh, some of the data that I pulled in because I, was, I, I had already converted and I was fully in LOR, uh, I had pixel data for my arches, my roof lines, and my spinners, and my yard borders. But I also had a ton of RGB data. And pulling that in was also important, and it actually became very tricky. So um, when, what, what I had to do was I had to figure out where I was going to start. And this was probably August 2015, where I began to uh, do my research. And what I learned was I had to have absolutely every single channel that I had in X light or in LOR match exactly with X lights and right down to the channel configuration. So what one of the things that I recommend to you folks is when you're building a new X lights layout uh, from your LOR layout, if you're pulling data in one for one and using this channel setup, make sure that everything it has the exact same start channels and X lights. If you have, if you have 30 models, uh, 30, 30 channels and they're, they're dedicated, the first 30 channels are dedicated to arches and X lights, your first 30 channels need to be dedicated to your arches. Um, the props must use the exact same pixel counts. The models must, must match the props identically. Uh, and another thing that I learned the hard way, a lesson I learned really the hard way was don't skip any universes whatsoever in X lights. Uh, if you skip a channel in, LO, in LOR, not, not a channel, but if you skip a universe, it doesn't matter in uh, LOR because LOR sends data out based on the channel you attach the sequencing to. Uh, in X lights, we, we sequence to the model and the model sends the, the information out to the channel that that model is assigned to. So it's two different ways to think about how data is transmitted out of the two separate softwares. Uh, also, the, the extra LOR channels, uh, there's some people may have used extra beat tracks or extra LOR AC channels inside their, uh, inside their LOR sequences. And what I found was sometimes my beat tracks counted as a channel and I had to increase that for my import. And sometimes that beat track didn't matter. That extra AC channel uh, didn't matter. So I didn't need to it, include it. And that made it very challenging for me because my AC channels and my, my LOR setup wasn't linear. But I, I worked really hard in order to get it that way so that I could pull my data in. So what you're looking at is an actual screenshot of whenever I had done my own data import i literally and i highly recommend if you're doing this that you have two monitors and you have lightarama s3 s4 s whatever uh on one side of your screen with your channel configuration as as you do as i do here on the right and your x lights layout screen on your left hand side uh that you build your models exactly as you see them in in your LOR configuration it makes your life 10 times easier now this is on, this is more geared towards anybody using the data layer method the uh, the the next page here this is an actual shot of the setup tab and my original setup tab if you look at the uh, if you look at the uh, user page there it says uh, uh, F user from my desktop, my backup folder, 2015, July 27th. So this is exactly when I was in history back in time going through this process. So like I said, it was real interesting to go back and review a lot of this. So this is a little bit more of a blown up shot of the channel configuration. And as you see here on the left hand side of your screen, on the right hand side of your screen, you see my channel numbers. And what I had to do was I literally went through my LOR configuration and I found out I had 90 channels of LOR. And that's what I dedicated to my first network type, which was the LOR dongle on a COM port outputting 90 channels. After that, I was done. I didn't put any more channels in there. My first universe in, uh, in LOR, oops, I backed up, let me go back here. Um, my first universe uh, in uh, X lights became, uh, 
uh, 510 channels because that was my dumb RGB universe. My second and third universes are always and have always been my roof lines. Uh, my fourth universe started getting into uh, my spinners, which used to be only 120, yeah, 120 pixels or 120 channels per spinner. Now it's much different. And I built my outputs exactly the same as what my universe usage was in X lights. And the reason for this was so that it was 100% one for one. But now, as you can see here, I have universe 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 17. And I beat my head against the wall until, um, until I was told that I actually had to go in here and add universe 15 and 16. And I had to literally add, and I put three channels in. And I had to go in to absolutely every single one of my models that were built uh, after into the 17th, 18th, and 19th universe. I had to change all of the start channels because we didn't have universe start channel. We had uh, the uh, absolute channel mapping back uh, in the turn of, of 2015 with X Lights 4. So, um, to recap on the data layer and, uh, and keep rolling on here, uh, I began importing data in August and September. Uh, I filmed a ton of videos on this. I actually still have the videos, but there were so many errors in my LOR layout that affected the import uh, that I never, I, I never was able to do a, a perfectly detailed video. So uh, I, I ended up not doing one, um, but what I found was, with a couple of the hints that I've added into this presentation today, the current videos, even though that they are three years old on data layers or two years old or however old they are now, um, that the current videos were, are just as helpful now as they were back then. I don't believe much has been changed as far as the data layer goes or is concerned. But in the end, I, had, I got it to work for me. Um, this, was, this took a lot of work. And uh, as many of you know, I do enjoy doing videos, but doing a how-to data layer video that was worthwhile for everybody to watch wasn't worth it for me to do because I couldn't do it justice and I couldn't do it better than it had already been done. So um, the data layer worked for me. I got it to work uh, and I was able to convert my 2015, uh, 2014 sequences into my 2015 X lights and it freed me from the very, very, very slow LOR S3, S4 platform. So um, with that, I wanna go into a couple reasons you may not want to consider using a data layer. So number one, if you're planning on moving things around in your X lights layout or in your, in your main layout, if you've created chases or anything within your uh, X lights, uh, or in your LOR sequencing that go from the right of your house, like a whole house away from the right to the left, and you decide to move models around, that sequencing is going to go with the old way. It's not going to go with the new way. So uh, data layers are linked to the channel. They're not linked to the model, as I said before. Remember that uh, if you're upgrading props from an original to a different pixel count, uh, and I'll give an example here. In 2015, I switched from a 1000 pixel mega tree and it's now 1600 pixels. Um, the data for the first 1000 pixels was correct. I just had, you know, an additional uh, uh, 12 more strings that I added on. So it, it was, it, it was, it was totally, it, it was totally useless to have that sequencing in there. So I had to sequence over top of it. Uh, the LOR channel configuration, it, it, if it's not linear with models and props, uh, for example, and, and I've known this to be true, uh, when, when we were in LOR, uh, a lot of us did some crazy stuff. If we had uh, controller one, two, and three dedicated to doing so many, product, uh, so many props on the one side of the house, and then we went to four, five, and six on the other side, and then we came back the next year and said, now I'm going to put seven, eight, nine on the other side of the house, and then you change your layout four years in, and you combine the first three with your last three, and now it's the first three and the last three have different universes and they're not in the same linear order. You're bringing in different data and what you use currently may be different than what you did use. So it's, it may not be reasonable for you to use a data layer in that instance. It may, it, it may work just fine, but if you've changed things so much from the original, then it may not be worth it for a lot of your props. 
The other thing I will say is uh, I, I know somebody who uh, used a matrix and had actually used like universe three and four uh, for half the matrix and then they made the matrix bigger and put it on universe 10, 11, and 12. And the reason why we did that was because it was easy to just add universes and add data to it and you just manipulated your channels in the sequence editor. And when you go to export that data, LOR is looking for, uh, looking for universes to send data to, so it does. Xlights is looking for all the data to be in the same place and so half of your sequencing would show up on half of your prop and the rest of the sequencing will show up on some other prop uh, because it, it just it, it's very hard to to manipulate that data in the data layer so uh, the the other thing is is if you're building models in X lights uh, uh, differently it becomes very confusing so if if you're considering a data layer remember uh, if you're changing a lot from where you were to where you're going, then it may not be reasonable to use the data layer. So uh, 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 there are plenty of good reasons to use the data layer. If you do have a lot of AC channels and RGB imports, then by all means, go ahead and use them. Sequencing is already done for you. You don't have to change it. If you're not changing anything, if you're running the identical display as last year and you just want to get it to work, that can happen. It will take you some time and some practice and maybe a couple attempts uh, on the import, but over some time you'll get it. Um, as long as you're running everything the same as last year, you shouldn't have any trouble. Uh, and then there's no time to learn, it, especially the, the best reason I would say is uh, you don't have time to learn how to sequence in x lights or sequencing uh, is already completed in LOR. I mean, pretty much these are some great reasons why. Um, and it's not a quick process, it does take time, so definitely sit down and give yourself some time when you're doing some data layer imports and so forth. So uh, if you're upgrading uh, data layer sequencing, this can be done. Uh, you can sequence right over top of a data layer. You can cover up any data on the ICQ file simply by placing an effect on top of it, but when that effect ends, whatever's underneath, will then be shown through and continue to output to lights. If you do not want sequencing to show through, there is an off effect. You have to place that on top in order to stop the data layer from showing through and outputting to lights. Uh, you can always edit the original LOR.LMS file in, X, uh, in your LOR sequence editor. You can cr literally create a duplicate copy of the LMS file, then you can go in and delete the prop sequencing for it, then re-import the new version of your, X, uh, of your LMS file into XLights. And once you do that, you don't have to worry about using that off uh, effect for XLights to cover up data that you don't want to be seen. And I highly recommend that for a lot of people. For example, my, my pixel spinners in 2015 grew from, uh, from 40 pixels to 96 pixels. And that made a big difference. So all my sequencing, for two spinners was now on one spinner and the data layer just didn't make it look right. I ended up having to use the off effect. Well, what I ended up really doing was go back and grab the original LMS file, deleting off the pixel sequencing for those spinners, saving it as a different name and then re-importing and it came out just fine. I didn't have to use the off effect and now I could just re-sequence those props. Um, that is the end of the presentation on data layers. Uh, I'm exactly where I thought I would be as far as time. We're about 36 minutes in. Does anybody have a question about data layers? I want to open this up now. So if you want to, please uh, unmute your microphone and go ahead and fire away. No questions, no takers. Okay, does anybody want to see an example of using a data layer or doing a data layer import? Yes. Okay. We'll go into X lights. This is pretty simple. Um, I have my one of my original sequencing um, views from 2000. This is 2006 after Christmas of 2015, or 2016 after 2015. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new sequence. Um, I'm going to create a musical sequence and I am going to hope for, let's see. Uh, 
We need to go find it. We need to go find the music file. That's what I need. Celebration. I'm going to create a standard uh, FPS and just do a quick start. Once I've created my sequence, there's nothing else in here at this at this point. I'm going to go in to the sequence settings, which is here, or we can go into settings here. Either place will take you to sequence settings. Whenever you open up the sequence settings box, you'll go to data layers tab. You will click on import. And then you'll go to where you will find your exact LMS file. So we're going to make sure, number one, that we have the LOR LMS file selected here. I'm going to go to my directory that has my LMS file, which is here. Uh, which one do I want to use? This one, 2010, this one here. When you select your file, you're going to have a conversion log come up. You'll have an all channels off at end, map empty LMS channels, and map LMS channels with no network. I, I usually do not um, check any of these boxes. I just click OK. Once your conversion is done, you go ahead and click Done. You have now created the ISEQ file. And what I'll do is I'll open up the sequence down here where my reindeer are because that's literally all the data that was in there. If I double click on my reindeer, which is an AC prop, I should find that there is a data layer type sequence inside here. As I said before, you cannot manipulate, you cannot change, you cannot uh, grab a hold of this. This is a this is like the tracing paper. We're on tracing paper right now. We can write over top of it. If I want to put the on effect here, I can just go ahead and do so. It will erase it. But if I go ahead and click the render button, wherever I didn't have it, it will show up for it. So if I go up to the, uh, if I go up here and I click, uh, let's render it again so you can see it. And if I click the on here, notice how the data is still there behind it. It's still on. And I have it on here, but it will continue to be on for these channels, even though I have effectively gone in and overwritten that data layer. The uh, other way, and I'll show you real quick, is using this off effect. Clicking the off effect will shut it off. There is nothing that will show through, period. So you can, uh, you can re-render the sequence. And if I select this and I bring the model preview down here, and I, it shouldn't blast me. As you can see, it works. So pretty much that is uh, everything about data layers that I can really teach you. Uh, there is one more thing that I can do, is I can show you, um, oops, I meant to render again, so oops, I thought I deleted that. Uh, we can show you that you, if you right click over top of a row, you can go to convert to effect. A lot of times this works perfectly. There are some isolated incidents where they do not convert exactly, but you can also right click and copy row after you've done that. And then you can go ahead and you can paste that to, you can paste that to any other specific uh, row that you'd like to and that data is now available for you to sequence and you can go through the entire display uh, the, the entire sequence there and you'll see that it's been copied down any questions on data layers All right, plug along here. Uh, I need to flip this the other way. Import mapping. Import mapping is the uh, 
second way that I listed on the um, on the class of what you can use to bring in data from LOR into X lights. Um, if you uh, are doing a mapping import, this is some of the reasons why you would. If you're using AC channels um, that you plan on sticking with for a number of years, I've stuck with my nine reindeer for five additional years, 10 years the reindeer have been on the roof and um, they work great. It as you can tell, the reindeer obviously were easy to pull in via the channel mapping or through the data layer, but they would be just as easy to map inside. Um, also using dumb RGB props, if there are dumb RGB props that you're using and you wanna pull that dumb RGB data, that, uh, that pixel data that you have or the, the color data that you wanna bring in, it's also able to be brought in. Uh, your effects, if your effects are simple on and off and fade style with along with the uh, shimmer and, and uh, the shimmer and twinkle, those come in just as well. If you're adding more pixel props to replace original single channel props and a data layer doesn't make sense, then I would use mapping. Importing other people's sequences can also be done. If somebody gives you their LMS sequence, you can actually bring their LMS sequence into your display. It doesn't have to be one for one. The channels don't need to match up. Everything doesn't have to match perfectly like a data layer. And this is one of the reasons why uh, you've seen so many more videos on my YouTube channel about this specific topic. So how does channel mapping work? Well, physically, you get to select the individual LOR channels. We use a drag and drop style activity. It's, it's non-automated. It, it's not like the data layer at all. It doesn't matter what channels are what. And uh, this, I have to give uh, Keith Wesley a huge uh, 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 props to because he watched probably, he dreadedly watched every single one of those crazy videos that I recorded in 2015 and 2017 on this subject. And uh, he actually made it so that it can be drag and drop and you don't have to do a thousand clicks. So uh, there, of course, are updated uh, videos on exactly how to do this. So uh, also the LOR sequencing for one prop can be applied over multiple props in X lights just by double clicking. Uh, so you, you, you're not stuck with, oh, okay, I have sequencing for my tree on, or uh, sequencing for my mini tree line over here, but I can take that same data and map that over to something else like my windows or maybe my stars on my roof. Uh, so it, you, you, you can save the time of sequencing by mapping multiple channels to mul uh, the same channels to multiple props. Um, my use of channel mapping, and here's an example, and uh, I just did the reindeer. Uh, whenever you do go in and create, and I can show you this afterwards here, uh, this is a very simple uh, import for the same song that you've heard from before. Once you go in and you set up an AC channel import, all you have to do is all your models will show up as long as they're entered into the layout tab. They'll show up here on the left hand side. You can uh, over here bring in your available data and those all compri are comprised of every model in X lights. Uh, clearly it's easier now. Um, before I would have had to take and map the individual clear green and red strands into one file and I made a whole video series on that but now you can create three maps for your red green and clear channels and map those over all of your individual models so it makes it much easier uh, AC channels are perfect for drag and drop you can assign any sequencing from any AC model into any RGB prop it doesn't matter the, the, the models don't care what color is attached to this. They will take whatever color is attached to this and assign it to that model. Um, but it doesn't matter what model you match up with one with another. Uh, where do you start whenever you uh, are doing a model, uh, a mapping import? Uh, and, and you have to remember that it's all model based. You build your models and it's very simple. You build your models freely however you want to build them. Uh, your sequencing is, uh, easily assigned from the LOR props via drag and drop. The same LOR prop, as I said before, can be uh, used in multiple x lights models. Uh, something else is building your x lights layouts. Um, models don't need to be fixed to a specific channel for mapping to work. You, you can lay, if you change the, the model, uh, the, the, the model start channel from 1 to 500, the, the data is actually saved with it. 
you don't have to worry about uh, what channels they are. Uh, any new prop editions can have sequencing assigned to them. So reasons not to use mapping. Um, I, I'll start with the one thing that used to be true and mapping was very time consuming. Uh, at this point in time, mapping is not as time consuming and that's simply because uh, you can save a map. You can remap something over and over again. You can go in and do one set of props at a time. You can do it at your leisure. It's a very easy process now. But reasons why you may not want to map are sequencing uh, is a standard twinkle, shimmer, fade on and off. If you have a lot of those effects and you're just recreating them in X-Lights, it might be better for you to learn how to do that in X-Lights in some cases. Um, you're not pulling in advance, uh, you're not pulling in any advanced effects from LOR into X lights. Literally, it is on off fade, shimmer, and twinkle. Uh, the, and then finally, the first map can be time consuming, as I said, but like I said, as I followed up, you can always, always do it at your leisure. It doesn't have to be done all at one time. Uh, and, it, you know, I, I, there's, there's more reasons to map than there is to not map. And I will, of course, show you how to do a simple mapping of a channel. And we'll do that now. So we'll open up X Lights. We will go in and create a new sequence, musical sequence. We can go into. No, that's not it. This one here. And we'll go into celebration. 20 frames per second, quick start. And then from this screen here, we'll go into the import tab or the import menu. We'll click on import effects. We're not going into settings and effects settings. We're going to import and import effects. So now I'm going to go find the exact file where I want to pull data in from, and that's in here. We can, we can change this file type to a .lms file. Once we've done that, we can select our original file we want to pull data in for. And as I said, uh, now it's literally one for, it's, it's a one for one lineup. You just click and drag the data from where you want it to where you want it to be. Um, in 2010, my arches were three, uh, five channel arches. I had six sets of those, and I could very easily map those to my newer arches. They may not work as good, or it might take me more time, but I literally can click and drag the data. Now, each of my arches now are 100 and, 108 AC channels. What I would do is I'd probably drag, I, I drag this over, I drag over, well, actually, you can double click to get rid of them if you screwed up and uh, select the one and you can double click and you can automatically bring it right in. So it, I could say maybe the first 10 of these channels are now arch 1-1 channel and now that data will map in. Let's say arch 1-2 uh, were here and I would just do the same thing. So the mapping is very simple. Um, if you have the same channel configuration, like this is from 2010, all of my 2010s, I could eventually go through, complete all of this importing, and I could save this map as a specific map name, and I could bring that map back every single time I do a data import until I got everything done. So therefore, I don't have to do all of my mapping at one time. So if I go down here to, let's see, I'm looking for my reindeer because that's literally the only thing left from 2010 that hasn't changed. Reindeer, right here is my reindeer. If I open it up, double click, oh, that was funny. And hit the little arrow down there. Now I have node number one through node number nine. These are my nine reindeer. Now, obviously I know that. It might take you some getting used to, to understand how the hierarchy of this works. Uh, but I know how I had built my models. My reindeer model is an AC model, as denoted by this white square here. It was built in a full um, mo uh, custom model by itself, and there's nine nodes. And I happen to know how they're set up. So I'm just gonna scroll down till I find my reindeer, and I can just click and drag very simply to populate the data from them. Oops. 
Well, that doesn't go there. Boy, did I screw that up. <laughs> but click and drag, this is, and, and like I said, I give Keith a lot of props for the work that he did. I can honestly remember when you used to have to click like three times here and then this dialog box would open and you had to scroll through and find everything or you typed a letter in and you got close to it. It literally took me hours to create my map. But once it's done, you can save the map. We can save this as mapping and this is from 2010. Save it, click OK. And now if we go in here and open up the reindeer, open up the strand, you'll see that we can zoom in and we have the exact same data that we had from before. We do have to hit render, and then once we render, we can see that this data is now available for me to click and drag on, manipulate, and change any way that I would like to. Uh, also, uh, now I know this is an AC prop, but if you were bringing AC data in from, uh, X, uh, from LOR into XLights and it was going into an RGB prop, you could go in here and change this to whatever color that would suit you. So. Um, that's pretty much this for the channel mapping. Does anybody have any questions on channel mapping? I, were you, um, I know this is a little off topic, but since we do have some lore folks here, would you mind showing the AC toolbar for a second, just to show you mm -hmm. know that feature? I know it's a little off topic, but. Um, you know, there, there might be some folks that, that don't realize that we've tried to model uh, x lights somewhat after lore. Yes, that was uh, one of the additions for sequencing that Keith had added in. The frustration of the LOR users was that uh, you couldn't sequence the same way as easily. So what I'm going to do, that I will make this just a little bit more uh, familiar to LOR users, and I will add in some timing marks. And I'm going to do that by clicking on Sequence Settings. I'm going to go to timings and I'm going to click new and I'm going to select here. I'm going to select 50 milliseconds timings and this is going to populate my a timing track for me so that it becomes a lot more. Oh, I create this popular this uh, uh, timing track that, that's a lot more familiar to what it was like to sequence in uh, LOR and what you have to do is you do have to go into tools, I'm sorry, settings, and you have to, is it settings? Uh, no, it's under view. You have to go into view and you have to activate your AC lights toolbar. Now, while you're in there, whether or not you liked it, it's available in, X, uh, in LOR, uh, in uh, X lights, thanks to Keith, he added a show AC ramps. So it looks like the ramps that you had in LOR uh, that kind of make it a lot more familiar. So when you do add a check mark to this, you'll see I, I lost my toolbar. I'll go ahead and put it back by clicking the AC toolbar check mark. And this here is not set in stone. You can move this wherever you need this to be. If you want this on uh, on the bottom of your screen, this can be down here. If you want this over here on the left side, you can put it here. If you want it right above your timing track, you can set it right on your timing track. So this is a floating widget bar that you're able to uh, use very easily. And it has pretty much the exact same functionality, very exacting. The only difference is the ramp up and ramp down doesn't work quite the way that it had in uh, LOR, but it is significantly, uh, uh, it works significantly well for whatever your uses might be. So I'm just gonna throw this back up in here. Um, and you have to activate the AC toolbar by clicking on it. Whenever you do, you'll notice that all of the effects have been uh, completely um, uh, dimmed. You cannot select any effect whatsoever. So over here, you have some selections such as the select arrow. This means that you can touch anywhere on the grid and uh, touch, and it won't make any changes. It just allows you to select an area. This is the toggle on off area. So if you want to shut off an effect or turn off an effect or delete it, this is what you would use. This is the same functionality that LOR had. This is the toggle on. Uh, I think actually LORs was toggle on off where this one is just on. So whenever you whenever you select and notice I'm, I'm into um, here's some pixel. Uh, these are pixel lines. You, you know you can you can sequence 
however you want. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be on the AC channels. You can sequence on the pixel lines as well. Uh, here you have shimmer. If you click, you can click and drag and add shimmer in. Um, I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. Uh, shimmer has that effect where it's blinking really fast. Uh, and if you turn off the AC mode, it, it creates that same effect here. As you can see, that's the shimmer effect. And it does that through the on effect. If you look at how the, the effect is created, uh, where is it at? This, here's on. And there's the checkbox for shimmer. So that's what uh, the LOR toolbar will default whenever you pull in uh, the AC toolbar, I should say, will default for shimmer for that. So we'll go ahead back into AC mode and we will continue. We have twinkle here and this does a twinkle. And you can see how it does twinkle on a, a different prop type of prop. If we go ahead and go out of AC mode, you'll see that this is the actual physical twinkle effect right here. So you can add twinkle and there's just a lot more options. You can, you can change it up, change the speed, the number of steps and so forth. Um, and then there's also the strobe option. So it really kind of expands on the options that you have. So if we reactivate this here, you'll see we have an intensity, um, an intensity tool. You can set the intensity to, um, to uh, a higher or lower amount. So if we want the on effect and we want the intensity set to something different, we can lower it by saying, uh, let's put it at 60. So now it's at 60% intensity. Um, if we are doing a fade up, we can click and drag. You can do a fade up. Did I change this? Let's, oh, let's uh, turn this off. You can see it does the fade up. If we go back into the view, it should show AC ramps. I don't know why it's not. But it, it, does, it does show ramps. Um, let's see if it'll show ramps whenever I'm not on an AC channel. So there's what the ramps would look like. But this is, this is at a node level versus the top level. So if I did this on the top level, let's see if that, that does the ramps for you. OK. Then obviously, you have the fade down. You also have the uh, ramp up, ramp down, which uh, in LOR, it did work a little bit differently. This centers it, whereas in LOR, the center, uh, if you started from the left, you would ramp it up, and then it would ramp down much further over here um, on the right-hand side. It actually kind of looks like it's offset. It's not perfect, but that, that certainly denotes what it does. It does a very good job at doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, and then you have the fill. Uh, fill was very useful whenever you created these fade up, fade downs, where you had um, where you had the off uh, effect here. Uh, let's go ahead and turn these off here. And if I wanted to, if I wanted to connect these two, let's see, where's is that off? I thought I had off. Um, oh. <laughs> I don't use it very much, but when I do, so there, there is a fade up and a fade down. And let me go ahead and delete this. So, so now that that's deleted, what this fill does is I'll hit the on effect and I'll use the fill and this should fill the area in between here and it should bridge the two between whatever's here and whatever's here. Um, the, the cascade is probably one of the biggest uh, helpful pieces. And as you can see here, a lot of my sequencing was like this, where you had this as a chase. Um, this AC toolbar here, the cascade allows us to cascade. And I do use this a whole lot just within um, whenever I am sequencing just any old regular sequence. Um, it doesn't matter. I could, I could grab the uh, shockwave effect here and I can then use it as far as cascading across these channels. So it does the same job. And then if I turn this off, you can see uh, it puts that into those specific uh, cells, if you will. 
Finally, we are we have paste to foreground and paste to background, and uh, I, I'm not going to pretend to remember exactly how all of those work. I do know that paste to foreground means to paste um, into all areas where there is nothing already sequenced. I think paste to background, paste underneath of things that have already been placed there. So, uh, and I really. Uh, I really don't know any more than that other than whenever I had to do it in LOR and it's been probably five years so I can't answer that intelligently. So I hope that answers the uh, short demo there that, that this, the, the question on uh, how to use the AC toolbar. Any other questions while we're in here? Okay, the last thing I want to finish up with um, And I need to swap these. Uh, the last thing I want to finish up with is uh, the superstar sequence import. And this is relatively quick. Uh, I know we've been going at this for an hour, about an hour now, almost an hour. Um, so in order to do a superstar sequence, this is really, really simple. Um, what you, why you use a superstar import? Well, if you currently own a license to the superstar sequencer and you know how to use it, don't be like me, buy a superstar and never ever ever use it because I wasted you know lots of money on it. Um, if you already have sequencing or SUP files, definitely, and you have the same models, bring them in. Bring in bring in the sequencing from that SUP file. You can do that. It's it's very simple. I don't know how to make an SUP file out of superstar. I don't know anything out of superstar other than what I'm about to show you today. So if you currently have or created any sequencing. Uh, and you have the SUP file, you can follow along. So basically how Superstar import works is we use, we click on in the x slice screen, we'll click on import and then import effects. This is the exact same thing we had done when we did our import for the LOR.LMS file. We set the import file type to the SUP on the bottom right of this file type. Once we do, we can select the SUP file that you're going to import. And then you can select the model that you want to import the data to. Make sure that your models are identical. If, if you're using something like an Arch, uh, there is some scaling. I don't know everything about scaling. I just know what gets me by. But this is a relatively simple process. So um, you, can, you, can, you definitely want to make sure your models, I, I guess identical is a bad word here. Maybe, maybe make sure your models are similar because if there is scaling involved, then, uh, then XLites can do that or help you do that. Uh, you can also choose the, file base, uh, choose the file base name for the images. It's going to ask you, what are, what are you gonna save these files as? And um, that's the next slide here, is what's the, file image, what's the file image that you wanna save this as? So what I have done is I already went in and I created in my XLites directory an images folder. And then inside that images folder, folder, I created a uh, another folder with the song name that is just for that image. And then in the file name menu below, it's asking me for a base name for the image. So I give it the song's first three initial or the song's initials, not first three, but the initials. So in today's, I'll show you in, in the example here in a second. Uh, once you're done, you click OK. Actually, you click Save. And, uh, and then you open up the model in XLites, and you can view the sequencing screen uh, to verify that the data has been imported. So we're going to go through this. This is definitely a very simple process. And finally, before I, I end the program, I, I want to repeat again what I started with, which is please, please support the XLites content creators. I can't. Um, I can't, uh, I, it's absolutely amazing what they've done for us. And the, the smallest thing that we can do is show our appreciation. So with that being said, the last thing I'm gonna go through is opening up X Lights. And we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna create a brand new sequence, musical sequence. I'm gonna select the sequence song. Uh, I'll, I'll select frames per second 40 for no apparent reason, and I'll, I'll click done. 
from this sequence screen, all you have to do is go to import, import effects, change your file type to .sup for superstar. I already have from uh, a sequence that uh, I have uh, picked up from Holiday Sequences. A huge shout out to Robert Jamie, he's a super guy. If you haven't bought any of his sequences, they are phenomenal and you'll get a chance to see them, one of them here. Uh, just select the file and click open. When you click open, your import, your superstar import box dialog comes up. You're going to select the model you want to map this data to. And I'm going to go right to my mega tree because that's what it's for. Whoops, that's the arch mega tree. There we go. Now, this is important. My sequences, or my, my mega tree is actually, it's not a 12 by 50, it is a 32 by 50. So the X size is the width and the height is the Y size if you're not uh, keen on the, uh, the X, Y axis and under, understanding it. I'm going to leave all of this as default for right now. And the reason I'm going to leave this as default is because you can import this sequence as many times as you want to get it right. If it doesn't come out right the first time, what you'll want to do is come in here, make sure your sizes are correct, and then begin playing with your resizing the images where you can change it to exact width, exact height, exact width or height, or all. Um, but I always recommend changing it to your, your definition size of your, of your pixel tree or whatever your prop is, and then clicking OK. This is instantaneous. To go to the next screen, it's going to ask you for the base name of your images. You'll go in and you'll click on, like I already created this. I would, you click create new folder, uh, and I already did that. I have an images folder here, and I know the name of the sequence is going to be Christmas Every Day. I created a new folder here for this, and once I did that, I go into here. Now, I've already done this, and I'm going to hopefully not crash X lights, control A. Maybe not. I have, uh, I have a very touchy uh, X lights um, import here. Uh, let me, let me uh, just forget that I'm gonna do this. What I'm gonna do is forget anything I just said right there. I'm just going to uh, go ahead and do the file import. I had already done this once to test it to make sure it worked and it did. I'm just going to change this to Christmas Every Day 1. And that's going to be the name for all of these images. When I click the enter button, it automatically will bring it in. And if I scroll down here to my mega tree, you'll see that it has imported everything already. So if we go ahead and we click render and we pull out the model preview, this will take a couple seconds to render. If you've never used this before, this is nice. You can see where how, how far something's coming along in the render process using the green bar at the bottom by clicking the bottom bar and following along. Um, I bet the resources in my computer are blasting up to, oh, only about 33% of the memory. So it's not bad. When you do a render, your entire FSEQ file goes into your memory. That way it will render faster, hopefully, the next time it goes. It's not always guaranteed. The x -Lights project exists because of people like you. Please help continue the project by making a donation today at xlights.org slash donate.